hear the welcome as God welcomes us and calls us to worship. To all who are weary in need of rest. To all who mourn and long for comfort. To all who feel lost and worthless and wonder if even God cares. To all who fail yet desire victory. To all who sin and need a savior. To all who hunger and thirst after righteousness. And to whoever else who will come, this church opens wide her doors and wel offers welcome in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. He is the friend of sinners. He is the lover of enemies. He is the defender of the weak and the justifier of all those who have no excuses left, but come to him and him alone. We come to him and we worship we come and we bow down before him. We come and cry out to him because he is good. He is holy. He is all in all. Let us stand as I pray. Father, would you hear our worship this morning? Would you equip us and would you fill us with your grace this morning as we declare your holiness and goodness and your mercy in Jesus Christ? And God's people said, amen. amen. Singing on the holiness and the power of God as well as the return of Jesus Christ should sober us if we're paying attention to the words. The psalmist sings and leads us to sing, not unto us, O Lord, not unto us, but to your name be the glory for the sake of your steadfast love and faithfulness. Why should the nations or unbelievers say, where is your God? Our response, our God is in the heavens and he does all that he pleases. Their idols are made of silver and gold. The work of human hands. They have mouths but cannot speak. They have eyes but do not see. They have ears but do not hear. They have hands but do not feel. They have feet but do not walk. They do not make a sound in their throat. All those who make them become like them. So do all who trust in them. We, what are we trusting in in this life? You know that all of us are wired to have about 50 to 30 fake needs that we live off of. We, we think we need these things. They're good things. They're blessings. But we make them into a need category where if I don't get them, I am moved. I am out of sorts. I am out of control. My heart is breaking. And we were made to need God and God alone in a type of way. And this morning, we recalibrate this morning as we gather, we remind ourselves our need, our true need is our holy God who will come someday, who has in Jesus Christ and will judge this God who has come first to redeem us and to make us a people. We trust in that steadfast love. We are going to do one of the most instructed commands for corporate worship in the Bible. Jesus said, or, G, Paul referred to Jesus making this mention that when you gather, do this as often as you meet. And that is, we are going to participate in the Lord's Supper or communion, the Lord's table. And while we do this, we are going to remember what G, who Jesus is what he's done for us, and this special covenant promise, his steadfast love that says, I will be your God, you'll be my people. I will remove all your sins. I will put my heart in you. I will put a new heart in you, and that new heart will be in you so that by your, my spirit, you will not turn away from me. This is a meal in which we take together as a church family. We, we look around and we say, you too, you and I together in this covenant by God's grace are called to follow Jesus, the King. 
And we're going to celebrate that this morning. Who is this communion meal for? Who communes and we commune with God, our Father, through Jesus Christ, who prepares this for us with his body and blood, and we commune with brothers and sisters in Christ who have also been purchased by his blood. If you are a member of God's household because you repented of your sins, you believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, and you looked away from yourself, and you looked fully to Christ, and you're sitting here this morning saying, Christ is my Savior, my Savior alone. I put my trust in Him. And I've been marked by that in obedience by baptism into his death. Not that that baptism saves me. He saves me. That baptism is the mark of obedience that says I am publicly confessed that he is my Lord. If you have done that, we, if you have put your trust in him, been baptized in his name, we invite you to come and take communion this morning. And the way we're going to do that in just a few minutes, we're going to... I'll invite you to stand, and we're going to sing during this time. You go down the outside aisles, make your way down the outside aisles, come forward. We'll have two elders or deacons with baskets, and you can take, uh, take these containers. We're, we're all, when COVID gets done, we'll move out of these things because they're, they're not great, but the symbol is great. Amen. These aren't great. The symbols are great. And so we look past them at this moment. And yet we remember that his blood was shed for us, symbolized in the juice. And in the bread or the cracker, his body was broken and bruised for our life and our justification. If you're here this morning and you're, you're saying, I don't even know what that means. But I think I want to know what it means. We'd, I'd love to talk to you after the service. Someone here that's up on the stage or greeted you at the door, would love to talk to you this morning about this saving love. Before we go into song, before we come and I welcome you to take communion this morning, I want to encourage you, I want to call you to confess to the Lord. Prepare your hearts. So would you bow your head and if you want, close your eyes in order to Remove distractions, and would you take a minute? Would you call out to the Lord and confess your sins where you have trusted in something else other than Him, when you have made other things a deeper need to your heart than He? Maybe it's pride, it's the fear of man. You've allowed bitterness or anger to control you rather than. Resting in the forgiveness and his love. And I encourage you now to confess your weakness and his strength. Our weary hearts doth rest secure. They trust his love to reassure. Though weak and frail, our souls distressing. Rejoice his strength, our ceaseless blessing. Oh God, help us as we come and we rejoice in your sacrifice, your covenant love. In Jesus' name, amen. I'm, I'm going to invite you to stand before we sing. I'm going to invite two elders or deacons to come to serve. Jason, if you could come, and Jim is coming up. On the night that Jesus was betrayed, the night before he would go to the cross and die for the sins of all who put their faith and trust in him, he took bread and he broke it and he gave it to all of the disciples and he said, this is my body. And he took wine and he poured it and he gave it to them. And he said, this is poured out for you. And he poured it out and he gave it to them. And he said, this is the blood of my covenant. This covenant in the past promised 
now coming to fulfillment. And it is for all of us today. We, this is our covenant meal. We renew covenant. We remember what he has done. He comes in a special way and meets us and reminds us of his love. So as we come, give thanks, confess sin, rejoice, thank God, pray for one another, exult in the fact that he has made us his family. God, thank you. Would you bless this this communion meal to our souls as we look to Christ and Christ alone, as we sing the song of the cross and remember and proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. In Jesus' name, amen. Come and take communion. As a family, let's go together in prayer to God the Father. Heavenly Father, we approach you now in prayer through your son, Jesus Christ. We praise and exalt you because of your steadfast love for us, your gracious gift of salvation through Christ, your patience when we fail to live up to your standards, and your continued work in our lives. How majestic is your name in all the earth. All of your ways, everything about you is perfect. Help us rejoice and find comfort in that. Lord, you are our rock, our fortress, our deliverer from sin. Help us take refuge in you and also rejoice in your strength that we so desperately need. Thank you, Lord, for your abundance of grace and mercy that we often take for granted. We ask that you would forgive us of our sins, those known and unknown, and bless us with your strength to resist temptation to sin. Lord, we pray that you will use this gathering of your people and the impact you make upon us today to all be used for your eternal purposes. We need you, Lord, to minister to all of us. We pray you would help us have peace and joy in whatever our circumstances may be. We pray that you would strengthen the faith of those who are single, our married couples and their families, our elderly, our widows. Lord, please bring healing to those who are struggling with physical and mental ailments, enabling them to experience your power and strength and then glorify you and rejoice in you for the healing you provided. Lord, we pray for our teens. Give them your strength to grow spiritually and make your word have an everlasting impact on their daily lives. Give them the confidence they need to live a gospel-filled life in a world that has abandoned you in many ways. Our missionaries need you, Lord. Please also give them the strength, the rest, and the focus they need to carry out your great commission. Equip each of them to preach the gospel and build your kingdom. Bless them with all the resources they need to be successful with carrying out your plans. Lord, we pray for all of our leaders at every level of government. Bless all the believers in positions of authority with a sense of confidence and boldness to share and defend the gospel. Give them the strength they need to combat the evilness and selfish desires of those in power. Lord, we plead with you to fill the positions of governmental authority with believers in Christ who will rule according to your word. We know in order for our great nation to be Christ-centered, there must be a revival a revival in our own individual hearts that comes from your power and strength. Please bless us to be more lovingly bold each and every day. Lord, we pray that you would not only bless the elders and deacons of Faith Church, but those of the gospel preaching churches in Linden, Fenton, Byron, Swartz Creek, Grand Blank, and Holly. Bless them with the strength, energy, and rest they need to do your work effectively and mightily so the congregations they lead grow in Christ and boldly live for him. Lord, we pray for those in attendance and those watching via the live stream who are not saved. May today be the day you work in their lives, ministering to them through the Holy Spirit. We pray you soften their hearts and you move them to believe in your Son as their Lord and Savior. Lord, we pray for Pastor Daniel as he brings us the message you have given him to deliver to us. 
Give him boldness as he preaches in your name. Remove all distraction, distractions in his mind. Help him focus and clearly articulate what it is you want us to know and to do and to be like. Please fill us with joy as we hear your word. Help us interpret the message you have to, for each of us and apply it to our lives so we can be holy, maintain unity within our church family, and consistently express and show love to one another. May we all leave here having grown more spiritually so we can become more Christ-like, loving and living for you more than ever before. For we are fully confident that neither death nor life nor angels, nor rulers, things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all of creation will be able to separate us from your love in Christ Jesus. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So would you turn with me in your Bibles to the 21st Psalm. And if you don't have a Bible, we invite you to take one of the Bibles should be in one of the chairs in front of you. And if you don't own a Bible, please take it with you. Take it home. Put your name in it. Make it your own and use it. We're at Psalm 21. The 21st Psalm. And when you came in this morning, you should have received a card like this that we give out about three times a year. And it gives the upcoming sermons. And we'll allow you to kind of see and look ahead to see where we're going to be and what psalms for each week in order to use it to prepare your minds and hearts for the coming service. I wonder if you feel strong this morning. Are you strong? Think about that for a second. It's kind of relative, isn't it? Compared to who? I've lifted weights from time to time, and when I do, I start to feel it. And if I'm really disciplined with my diet, I can look in the mirror, and I can begin to admire the strength that I see, but then I go to a real gym where there are bodybuilders, and all is put into perspective. I have one brother, my kid brother, who's 12 years younger than me, Matthew. He makes me look like a little petite punter in a football game, and he looks like a big linebacker. Strength depends on who's, who you're with. Then there are forces of strength that remind us how weak any human being is. I bet you when anything that when the tornadoes in Mayfield, Kentucky came through... The strongest bodybuilder felt the futility of his own strength. The Lord God controls our weather, our wind. He controls everything. He controls us. He looks down from heaven, the psalmist says, and sees all the children of man from where he sits enthroned upon the earth. He looks at the inhabitants of earth. He who fashions the hearts of them, he observes all of our deeds. And it says here in Psalm 33 that the king is not saved by his great army. A warrior is not delivered by his great strength. The war horse is a false hope for salvation. Or in Psalm 147, God's delight is not in the strength of a horse nor in the pleasure of the legs of men. But the Lord takes pleasure in those who fear him and who hope in his steadfast love. We are weak in ourselves. We feel it in our aging bodies and minds. Some of you aren't there yet. Trust me, it'll come. I hear some chuckles. So that chuckle is an amen, isn't it? We feel it in our lack of discipline, our weakness in our lack of discipline, our lack of self-control. We feel it when difficult people and difficult circumstances trample through our lives, leaving us 
upside down and helpless to respond the way we should in all, far too often. Where is our strength? Are you strong this morning in the most important way? And I guess we could say the most important way is always a spiritual type of strength. Those who are old, where is your strength? Young teenagers, where are you going to have the strength that matters? And with this, mind, this in mind, let's look at Psalm 21. Because in this psalm, we have this theme coming through loud and clear. Listen as I read. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, and in your steadfast love how greatly he exalts. You have given him his heart's desires and have not withheld the request of his lips. Selah. For you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. He asked life of you and you gave it to him. Length of days forever and ever. His glory is great through your salvation. Splendor and majesty you bestow on him. For you make him most blessed forever. You make him glad with the joy of your presence. For the king trusts in the Lord. And through the steadfast love of the Most High, he shall not be moved. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. You will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume them. You will destroy their descendants from the earth and their offspring from the, among the children of man. Though they plan evil against you, though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. For you will put them to flight. You will aim at their faces with your bows. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. We will sing and praise your power. This is God's word inspired for his people. This, this psalm is a companion psalm to the psalm before it, Psalm 20. In Psalm 20... The king, which is David, he gathers his people in some pre-battle liturgy and he calls them to pray to God for deliverance and victory for the coming battle. And in Psalm 21, with similar but different language, the king, David, rejoices in victory. Prayers made, Psalm 20. Prayers answered, Psalm 21. This psalm is a royal psalm, a psalm of the king. He's rejoicing in the Lord, this king. He's rejoicing about God's work for the king and the king's testimony and his hope. And he knows that his strength is in the Lord and the Lord alone. This psalm, if you look at it closely, spend some time in it, it is framed on the strength of the Lord. You look at verse 1 and verse 13. Look at verse 1. O Lord, in your strength the king rejoices, in your salvation how greatly he exalts. And then look at verse 13 at the end of the psalm. Be exalted, O Lord, in your strength. This psalm calls us calls David, calls the people of Israel, it calls the believing people in the New Testament in Faith Church of Linden, it calls all people to rejoice, to trust, to exalt in God because of His strength. I want you to think of the strength and might of the Lord this morning. Oh, I pray that we would be freshly impacted by the reality of the strength of the Lord in contrast to our lack of strength, our weakness. You see, the weary heart doth rest secure. It trusts His love to reassure. Though weak and frail, the soul distressing, rejoice the strength, His strength, our ceaseless blessing, the psalm says to us. Why rejoice? And how do we see the strength of God in this psalm? David gives us, and there's two parts to this psalm. 
If you, if you stare at the psalm, you see it's 13 verses, and you see, I already shared with you, there's bookends of strength in verse 1 and verse 13. If you go right to the middle of the psalm in verse 7, you, that would be one that's really worth highlighting as you see the king rejoicing, or the reason for his rejoicing and for God's blessing, it says that he has trusted in the Lord, and he is not moved in anything because of the steadfast love of the Most High. And sandwiched between the beginning and the end with that middle verse of God, God's king, David, trusting in God, rejoicing in the strength, you find verses 2 through 6, a section, a section that looks back and says, you have done this, O God. Thank you. It is a reflection back in a thanksgiving to God for God's blessings. And in verses 8 through 12, we have David looking forward in expectation of hope. Because you see, the God who is strong, the Most High, whose steadfast love he trusts in, and therefore is not moved or shaken or thrown off course when trials and difficulties come, Because God has promised that he is going to defeat all his enemies. And so I guess I want to frame it to us this morning to worship God by by leaning into this passage and saying, God, help me to see freshly, profoundly, deeply to my soul's heart the strength of the Lord that I need to rejoice in. Yes, I, my weary, often wandering, my frail and weak heart find strength in this God found in these verses. And so let's look at it from the two perspectives. One, we rejoice in the strength of the Lord, number one, because the Lord blesses his own. And I see that in verses two through six. Now he says he blesses the king, but I'm going to apply that to us and kind of connect the king at the end of the sermon. So he blesses his own, verses 2 through 6. David the king rejoices with thanksgiving for God's strength displayed, responding to his needs. David is a needy king. He isn't mighty in his own strength. He has just gone through, through problem after problem, after enemy after enemy, and deliverance after deliverance. Psalm 18 is a cry, I love you, O God, my strength, Psalm 18. 18 verse 1, and he lists the de- he declares the deliverances of God. God delivered him from this, and in verses 2 through 6, he says, Trust, you want to see God's strength? He blesses his own. He doesn't remove all trials, but he allows trials and difficulties and enemies, oppositions and afflictions in our lives. We could categorize them into two. He gives difficult people in our lives, and he allows difficult circumstances to go through our lives. But in the midst of all of that, and through all of that, he blesses his own. Listen to David blessing the Lord, praising God for God's blessings. He says, you have given him his heart's desire, verse 2, and have not withheld the request of his lips, for you met him with rich blessings. And I've categorized verses 2 through 6. I've given several labels to some of these, cat- these blessings. And I think they apply to us in which we can rejoice in the blessings of God to his own. He gives answering blessings. He says in verse 2, he says, you have given me. You have given his heart's desire and have not withheld the request of his lips. David does not believe that God is just some divine genie out there, that whatever he chooses to wish and desire, God is going to grant that desire. No, David is God's man, a man after God's own heart. He has delighted his heart in the Lord, and he knows that because of that, God in his mercy is going to fulfill his desires for righteousness. And so when we find here, David is rejoicing and saying, oh, one of the great blessings that shows the might and strength of God is he is an answering God. In fact, he says, for you, he says, you have not withheld 
from me the requests of my lips. In chapter 20, verse 4, he says, May God grant the, heart, the king's heart's desire and may the Lord fulfill all his petitions. Friends, we, we talk about prayer. I call you to pray. You call to each other and ask each other to pray all of the time. We do that because we believe that God is a prayer-hearing God and an answering prayer God. He says, ask and it shall be given to you. Seek and you shall find. Knock and it will be opened to you because he is a father towards his children in such a way that he says, I want to give good gifts to you so that you see that I am the giver, you're the recipient, I get the glory, you get the help. You learn to depend fully on me in all things. David would says this kind of stuff all the time, like in Psalm 138. On the day I called, you answered me. My strength of soul, you increased. One of the great blessings that God has given to us, that we remember his strength. You want to be strong this week? Look to a God who's an answering God. Secondly, look to a God who's a satisfying God. We see that in this psalm. Look at verse 2. You have given his heart's desire. Or verse 6. You have made him glad with the joy of your presence. God is... The world offers satisfaction that lasts for like three seconds. For like a millisecond in eternity's perspective. And God satisfies forever. This morning when we're taking communion, we're thinking about the covenant that God made for us. We will rejoice in what this covenant meal represents, God's love to us forever. It is satisfying. It never, ever can compete. The things of this world cannot compete with the satisfaction that God brings to his people David sings of this in a psalm that we saw earlier, or actually last year, Psalm 16. He says, I have set the Lord always before me. Because why? Because he's my strength. He blesses his own. And he says, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. That is my, the strength of my heart. Or Psalm 4, 7. In the midst of all his afflictions and enemies that are attacking David, he would say, God, you have put more joy in my heart than they, the world, when their grain and wine abound. You put more joy in my heart. Oh, that the world would see in us a people that have been so gripped by the strength of a God who blesses his people that we say, God is my satisfaction as David in this psalm will say, God is his satisfaction. But not only is it satisfying, it's generous. David praised God for his strength Because he blesses him in a generous way. He says in verse 3, For you meet him with rich blessings. You set a crown of fine gold upon his head. Now, this is the king talking. A king that been promised the kingship. And he's rejoicing that God does not take a thimble full of blessing. And say, I'm going to ration it out to you, King David. And he doesn't take a thimble full of of life blessings to you, Christian, and say, I'm going to give you a thimble full of help and grace in this lifetime. He shovels it upon his people. He pours it out. Read Ephesians 1. He lavishes his grace upon us. And David is going to say, he has given rich blessings. Oh, that we would fix in our hearts, people, To be the kind of people that look to the strength of the Lord and say, He is a generous God to me. When I don't feel it, I know He's storing up His generosity. And I trust Him that He is going to bring it and is going to make all of the sorrows that are around me. All of the the things that are filling my heart with anguish to fleet away and bring blessings on my head. One of the... When we celebrated the Lord's Supper, 
we, re- we are reminded of the new covenant in his blood. And the new covenant is referred to in many places in the Old Testament, in some by name, and especially in Jeremiah chapter 31 and 32. And in Jeremiah 32, there is a promise that Jesus is the fulfillment of it, that God's people, God was going to come to his people, and he has already. And it says this, and he says, you will be my people, and they will be my God. I, they will be my people, and I will be their God, and I will give them one heart and one way. Now, listen to the generous heart of God. This is the God that you pray to. This is the God that you follow. This is the God through Jesus Christ. He says, and I will make with them an everlasting covenant with them, and I will not turn away from doing good to them, and I will put the fear of me in their hearts, and they will not turn away from me, and I will rejoice to doing them good, and I will plant them in this land of faithful, in faithfulness with all my heart and with all my soul. God is not a stingy God towards us. His steadfast love is generous and abounding. It is full of mercy and grace. And next, it's lasting. It's lasting. David says in verse 4, he, he's referring to the king. He asked of life of you and you gave it to him. Length of days, David says, forever and ever. Or in verse 6, for you make him blessed forever. Now what is David referring to? Does David, is David under the, some kind of assumption that David is going to live forever on earth? That he was not going to die like everyone else before and I guess after him, and the reality is he knew he was going to die, but he knew the resurrection. But more than that, he knew that God had made a covenant with him that his seed, his line would continue on forever. But that forever and forever would be a king like no other king, and it would last forever. And as we ponder the blessings of God blessing and showing his strength to his own, he says, I will show you my strength, and my strength will be for you forever. The last thing that I see about this blessing of God's own people is that it's saving. He he worships God. He, He rejoices in the strength of God that God is this saving, strong God. He says in verse 1, at the end of 1, In your salvation, how greatly this king exalts. Or in verse 5, his glory is great through your, your, he's referring to God, your God's salvation. Your deliverance. Your deliverance from the battle. Your deliverance against the enemy. Your deliverance against sin. God is a God who blesses and delivers his people. It is what David will Sing over and over again, and so should, so must we. Rejoice in the strength of the Lord, faith church. He blesses his own. He benefits, his benefits to us far exceed all of the benefits the United States government could provide for you. His pleasure is all that matters, not the pleasure of those people that you far too often fear losing. The reason we are and will be blessed forever, the reason why we have these blessings that I just listed, I've listed answering blessings and satisfying blessings and generous blessings and lasting blessings and saving blessings, the reason is because the Lord is our strength. It's in the Lord's strength that we rejoice. It creates a rejoicing heart, a joyful heart, a heart that praises. As Nehemiah would say, the joy of the Lord is our strength. And now, right now, you might not feel it. I realize that some of you might be coming to this service this morning not feeling overflowing with blessing. You feel the weight of difficult people or difficult circumstances in your life. Right now, you might be overwhelmed with 
pain and the frailty of your life. But he is working to transform you into away from a self-reliant person to a God-reliant person. I, I, want, I want you to reflect on this for a second. Where has God blessed you? And you need to, like David, take an account and give thanks to him today. Where do you, like David, need to say, Lord, in you, my rejoice in your strength. You are the God of my salvation because you have done this and because you're doing this. And when I was in this place, you did this. And because of this, I can do this. Where is it? Can you rejoice in your salvation, the forgiveness of your sins? Can you rejoice in how God has used family in your life and how God has used even difficult family in your life to bring you to a place where you could see that there is only hope in the truest family, and that's in God and God alone and through his people and ultimately through Jesus Christ? I wonder what small thing God did for you this last week that you need to rejoice in his strength. He kept you safe on the roads this week. He kept you all safe on the roads this week. He did for me last week, driving back from Minnesota as we, we beat the storm coming through. He kept you alive last night, if you're here. He kept you from being devastated by certain circumstances, and he allowed what seems like devastating circumstances for some of you, and I know for some of you in losing loved ones this past year, and yet he kept you trusting in him. That's his strength coming out in you. Would you, would you bless him this morning? Will you praise him this morning? Will you give thanks for his past blessings? Would you reflect upon them? This psalm rejoices in the Lord's strength because of the blessings of, of God to the king. The God to the king through a mighty victory or for whatever it is in verses 2 through 6. But he also rejoices because the Lord will defeat all his enemies. Look with me at verses 8 through 12. These are kind of harsh verses. These are verses that to a modern, American, nice, politically correct, we don't want to say anything kind of hard or sound angry in any way, kind of difficult. But here David is going to declare rejoicing that his enemies will be defeated and he has great expectation and hope. He says here, all God's enemies will be thwarted. Look at verse 11. Though they plan evil against you, Though they devise mischief, they will not succeed. You and I may have literal enemies. And I don't know who, you might be sitting here and go, I really do have a literal enemy. This person, she wants me dead. Or at least wants my life miserable. He wants to ruin me. I know that you have faced those kinds of circumstances with real live human being enemies. Some of you might not be sitting here saying, I don't think there's anybody that's quite at that level, but all of us. And, and we may not face the circumstances of a King David who had King Saul who wanted him dead, who wanted the, had the Philistines who wanted him dead, who had other nations wanting him dead. Even his own son later in life tried to take over his kingdom and want him, wanted him dead. We may not have that, but each and every one of us has the enemies of sin, Satan, and the world, the system of the world, that desires to destroy our faith in God. Oh, sin, sin is our great enemy. Sin is the most despicable reality of which we should hate and despise. Not primarily the sin of others, but our own sin in our own hearts. And it is an enemy against us. David here rejoices that God will defeat all enemies. God will defeat all his own enemies. He will expose them in verse 8. It says here, your hand will find out your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. I hope that it's not speaking about anyone in this room. 
Because you see that God will, there will come a day when God, the righteous Lord of the universe, with his son, will come. It says in Revelation 19, I saw heavens open and behold a white horse. And the one sitting on that horse is called faithful and true. And in righteousness, he judges and he makes war. First time he came, he came on a donkey. He came to die. To rescue a people who will repent of their sins and believe. There will come a day when this king will come on a white horse. His eyes are like a flame of fire, it says. On his head are many diadems. His name is written on him that no one knows but himself. He is clothed in a robe dipped in blood. And the name by which he is called is the word of God. And the armies of heaven, arrayed in fine linen, white and pure, were following him on white horses. From his mouth comes a sharp sword with which to strike the nations. And he will rule them with a rod of iron. He will tread the winepress of the fury of the wrath of God, the Almighty. On his robe and on his thigh, he has a name written, King of Kings and Lord of Lords. This God will come, and it says in verse 8, he will expose them. Your hand will find out all your enemies. Your right hand will find out those who hate you. And I do pray that that will not be true of anyone in this room. I pray that will never be true of anyone that is a member of faith church. All members are professors in Christ Jesus, but just because they profess him, there is such a thing as a a fake Christian that has been living a lie, and he will reveal the real and the fake, the good and the bad. Or as Paul or Jesus uses this language, just as the weeds are gathered and burned with fire in Matthew 13, so will be the end of the age, and the Son of Man will send his angels, and they will gather out the kingdoms and and causes of sin and lawbreakers, and he will throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there'll be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Look at, listen to what verse Psalm 21 says. Psalm 21 says, you will make them as a blazing oven when you appear. The Lord will swallow them up in his wrath and fire will consume him. This is not some Rated G scene. This is terror when the Lord comes. So Matthew 13 says, The kingdom of heaven is like a net that will be thrown into the sea and gathered, and will gather every fish of every kind. And when it's full, men drew it ashore and sat down and sorted the good into containers, but threw the bad away. So it will be at the end of the age. The angels will come out and separate the evil from the righteous and throw them into the fiery furnace. In that place, there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. I bring this up to you not only because it's in the text of Psalm 21. It is a central message in which we as all believers need to embrace. And we need to embrace it with A couple ways of responding. This is real. There is going to be a judgment. He will judge all those who have not turned to Christ alone for forgiveness. And he will punish them in hell forever. That should make us, first of all, really thankful and praise God for what he has done. I deserve hell and he has given me his grace. And he has lavished upon blessing after blessing forever in a generous way. It should also make us really urgent. And I don't think we're, I'm not urgent enough. I need to preach with more urgency. You need to live with more urgency. We need to live with more urgency. On Wednesday night, we take a list of people that we're praying for that are not Christians. They're not saved. And because we believe the Bible, if they're not Christians, if they've never put their faith and trust in Christ, that means if they died today, they would burn in hell forever. Let's just say it that way. I don't think we th- believe that because we're not urgent enough. We don't pray, and, we, we, and if we do pray, that's all we do. We, we need to pray, and we need to care, and we need to look for opportunities and some of you, there's nothing you can do with 
but prayer because you've been doing everything you can and you continue. And I pray that God would bless you as you continue to cry on the name of the Lord for that dear child or parent or friend or neighbor. But oh, Faith Church, we need to wake up to the realities of Psalm 21 and the coming expectation of a king who will defeat all his enemies. Let us not come to the end of the age and be so casual in our approach to the lost, our approach to the coming judgment. This leads to the, a question as we wrap up, who are his own? I've been saying that he, he's the strength and he blesses his own, but he also is going to ju- come and judge and defeat his enemies. So who are his own and who are not his own, therefore his enemies? I guess I answer that. Those who are not his own are his enemies. And those who are his own, well, look at verse 7 of this psalm, Psalm 21. The king trusts in the Lord. And through the steadfast love of the Most High, He shall not be moved. Now, he's talking about the king here. And the king trusts in the Lord and receives God's blessings. The king trusts in the Lord. And the king trusts that God is going to defeat all his enemies. This is a loyal type of trusting in God. And it is the type of trusting that the king had, King David. And so did another king have. And that we are all called to have this kind of, I'm weak. But I trust in the Lord to be my salvation. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes, that word believe, trusts, puts his faith in, clings to. The king trusts in the Lord, God's people, his own trust in the Lord. Who are his own? You want to be his own? Maybe you're, you, you might sit here this morning and say, am I God's own that he blesses? Or am I the one that he will someday Defeat, well, it says here, I think it implies here that those who trust in his promise, his steadfast love, are made his own. And there's an invitation here of the good news. You can become his own if you confess your sins and you trust in the steadfast love of the Lord who sent his only begotten son, Jesus, to die on a cross to offer you the free gift of the removal of all your guilt and sin and the, the arrival, the, the, the transference of all his family blessings upon you forever. All you do is accept his gift by trusting in him and turning away from your sin and, and look to him alone. That's his own. But you see, you might say, but Daniel, this is all about the king. It's the king rejoices in his strength. It is the king who trusts in the Lord, verse 7. It's the king who rejoices in all of the blessings in verses 2 through 6. It's the king who looks in expectation that God will use him to defeat all his enemies in verses 8 through 12. Yes, it is the king. It is a royal psalm. But this psalm and many of other psalms is meant to point us to the King of kings and Lord of lords, King Jesus. Jesus, the Messiah, Jesus Christ is God's anointed, the King. And God, it starts with the King rejoicing in the Lord's strength. Look at verse 1. It ends with a people rejoicing in verse 13. They rejoice. We rejoice. It's a... it's. More than the king rejoicing, it's his people. Because their salvation is in the king's salvation. It is for all who trust in the king to provide victory. Jesus is that king. Jesus is that good news. All of these blessings to the king are blessings to the king's people who become his people. The victory of the king becomes the people's victory. Overcoming enemies of the king become the blessings on all who are under his reign. Oh, we long for verses 2 through 6. We long for his satisfaction. 
of strength and blessing and generosity to come upon us as we look to the King of kings and the Lord of lords. This king came to earth and he trusted in the Lord. It says in 1 Peter chapter 2 that though he was reviled, he did not revile against it. Though he was tormented and treated badly, he kept entrusting his soul to God, his father on earth, as, he, as God becoming man. And so he laid down and bore our sins that he would be our righteousness. God raised him from the dead. And this King Jesus will reign forever and ever again. He comes, as we sang this Christmas, to make his blessings flow far as the curse is found. Blessings that Psalm 21 exalt in. Because he rules the world with truth and grace. He makes his nation, the nations prove the glories of his righteousness and wonders of his love. Faith Church, friends, you're here this morning. Rejoice in the strength of the Lord. Rejoice in the strength of the King. Trust not yourself. You can't do it, but he can. Trust in his steadfast love. Look to him. His blessings are what you need not the blessings that come and are provided for outside. He, those, anything outside are from him, but trust in him and him alone. He blesses those who look to him. Our weary hearts rest secure. Our trust in his love reassures. We're weak and we're frail. Our souls are distressing. May we rejoice. His strength is our ceaseless blessing. Let us believe that. Let's rejoice in that. And let us look around us in your home, in your neighborhood, at your work, at your school, your friend network in school. Oh, may we love them and long for them to be brought to this king. Let's pray. Father. I pray that you would help the truth of Psalm 21, the truth of Jesus Christ, our King, the strength that the King rejoiced in. I pray that we would rejoice. I pray that our weary hearts would lift up in strength to the Lord with worship. I pray that we would find our security in Christ and Christ alone. God, give us an urgency, a joy. Give us a hope, but also a mission to proclaim this king wherever we go. In Jesus' name, amen. Before we get to the benediction, we have, I guess, some, some business, but it's, it's really business to live out just being the family of God and growing in the Lord. And so if you're, if you're new here, welcome. We're so glad you're here. And we'd encourage you to take a sheet, one of the cards in front of you, and fill that out. If you're new or not new, there's also a place there to put a prayer request. And you could put that in that card and put it in the box in the back. Or you could give it to me or one of the ushers as you go. But we're really glad you're here. We want to help you, kind of welcome you into the family and know how to get part of the body here at Faith Church. There are several announcements I want to let you know about. One, one is just a practical. Most people have 10 cent refund cans or bottles of some kind. We have, we're, we're going to just collect, uh, Carrie Watkins is kind of leading this up, had a great idea. Hey, we are, we have too many teens right now packing the hallways down there. That's going to be another problem we need to figure out to get more space on this end of the building, especially Wednesday nights. But they also need chairs. The, old, the chairs they've been in, just old. We want to replace them. Some have already given donations, and you can do that as well. But we're going to ask you to bring in your cans Wednesdays and Sundays. And Carrie's going to take them, take them out so that they're not smelling too long. They're not going to stay in the building. But I, I, this is one fun way of just kind of seeing some money come in to raise for the youth ministry, the students. Uh, and so we there's an opportunity for you to be involved in that. Here's another announcement. This actually 
the ladies are going to be this, set, this Tuesday at 11 o'clock and 6 o'clock uh, for a Proverbs study. If you're not part of that, you can still get, become part of that this, this Tuesday, the 11th at 11 o'clock. But men will begin their study this Saturday at 8 o'clock. This is a fantastic discipleship tool, knowing God that you're going to read together starting this Sunday or the Saturday at 8 o'clock. There is a sign up. A lot of you have signed up already. I hope if you haven't already signed up that you can be part of that. So that's going to start this Saturday. Also, not this, fr- not this coming Friday, but the following Friday, if you are new to Faith Church, we would love to have you come to our house on Friday, January 21st at 6 o'clock. It'll include a supper, and it will include a time in which we talk about what does it mean to be part of Faith Church? What is membership? What it, and we, we spend time doing that together. It's a, I, I, I enjoy it. Most people that come have a good time and, and ability to be able to get to know some other people as well as know more about the church. So there is a sign-up. A few of you have already signed up for this. We'd love to have you come. That's going to be on the 21st. Again, in the hallway, there's sign-ups for all of these things. Um, beginning on January 23rd, so some of you... Um, some of you already are coming regularly, but we have a Sunday school class that meets for all ages in the building at 9 o'clock. So 10 o'clock is worship, 9 o'clock from 9 to 9.45. We have Sunday school for all ages. We are actually going to start this. We have two announcements about this. Starting in two weeks on the 23rd, we're going to start a new study in this room on biblical manhood and womanhood. It's going to talk about gender. It's going to talk about other things like that, something you know, things that are really relevant in our culture, but we want to do it from the Bible's perspective. I think this is going to be a really important class as we just dig into what God's word has to say about God making men and women. He made them different. He gave them unique roles, and we rejoice in it even though the world will not rejoice in it. And so we will, we will be having that. That will start in two weeks from today on the 23rd. Okay, but let's look at next week. Starting next week, and there is a sign about here. This is kind of a new announcement. Starting next week, we are going to have uh, uh, Dave and Tracy Wagner are going to facilitate a discussion on a book during that Sunday school hour, during the 9 o'clock hour. So we'll have a general class here and then probably in the conference room unless there are, are many signing up and then we'll move to the fellowship hall if we need more space. There's a sign up, and this is a class that's for parents of teens particularly, or preteens, or maybe your grandparenting and your grandparenting teens, you want to be part of that as well. They're going to go through a book, a really helpful book by Paul Tripp called Age of Opportunity, starting next week on the 16th. But he sent us a video. Let's just watch that for a minute.
That will start next week. Dave didn't tell me, but I'm not sure if your parents are supposed to bring Xbox controllers with you. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I don't know. Uh, we, we, not, we not only have one video, but we have two videos to show you. So the last main announcements announcement is for something to, I want you to really um, start thinking about, and I, I, if I can beg you to sign up for this, because I think this will, I really think this could change your life. You know, say, I don't need my life changing. You might need it more than you think. And that is on the subject of forgiveness, the freedom and power of forgiveness, God's forgiveness to you and your ability to deal with difficult people and respond to them with forgiveness. We have a sign up out here for that. It's going to be a conference that we're going to have on February, cha Feb February chapter, February, <laughs> February 19th and 20th. So that weekend, it will be a Saturday conference from 930 to 330 with a friend of mine. He's in Arizona. He's the CEO of CTO Ministries. He's a, great, he's a mentor in my life a blessing. He made a video for us. He's also going to be leading on the same subject, all of our teens. We have about 50 teens that are going to be, what's that? Yeah. yeah. Over 50 teens that will be at Camp Barakel three, week, three weeks from today, this weekend, they'll be coming back. And so he's going to, he's going to kind of like challenge our teens. They're going to come and challenge you parents and all adults. And then we're going to gather on that weekend of the 19th and the 20th for this. Here's a short video. Jesus was once asked, what is the greatest commandment of all? We find his response to that question in Matthew chapter 22. We call it the great commandment, where he said we're to love God and to love others. I'm convinced one of the biggest violations of love is the lack of forgiveness. Hebrews says, see to it that no one misses the grace of God by allowing a root of bitterness that grows up, causes trouble, and defiles many. You see, here's the reality, you guys. There is no shortage of sin around us. You are going to be sinned against by others until the day that they die, and you are going to sin against others until the day that you die. Now, if you don't deal with other people's sins against you, that can easily turn into bitterness. And if you don't deal with your sin against others, that can easily turn into guilt. Bitterness and guilt, two things that can destroy you from the inside out and just totally destroy the relationships around you. Now here's the good news. The gospel addresses both of those. Hi, I'm Randy Murphy. I'm executive director of CTO Ministries. We're an organization that exists to help equip the church to fulfill the Great Commission by making disciples who make disciples. Over the past year, it's been my privilege to get to know Mike Dunsford better and for my wife and I to personally get to know Daniel and Molly uh, a lot better. You guys are just so blessed to have a staff around you that really desires to shepherd you biblically and intentionally. And I hope you don't take that for granted. I'm excited to have the opportunity to spend some time with you guys here in the next month. First, we're going to be at Camp Barakel for winter camp with your high school students. We're going to be addressing the whole topic of forgiven. And we are so looking forward to that. A couple weeks later, I'm going to be there at Faith Linden, and we will have an all-day seminar, and then speak on Sunday morning and in your uh, adult class as well. And we're going to talk about the power of forgiveness. We've been forgiven to forgive. I hope you'll come and join us because we are going to give you some very practical tools to learn how to implement biblical forgiveness into your lives and relationships. And we hope out of that to see people free from bitterness and guilt and to see relationships reconciled that have been hindered by sin and hurt between each other. So I hope you'll join us. If you haven't been to camp yet, boy, we hope you'll come to winter camp students and join us there. If you have already been to camp and you're seeing this video now, I just want to ask you one question. 
Have you used your Jenga block yet? I hope so. Well, I'm looking forward to seeing you soon, and I just want to leave you with this passage of Scripture out of Colossians 3, 12 through 14. So those who have been chosen by God, holy and beloved, put on a heart of compassion, of kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, and forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord has forgiven you, so also should you. Beyond all these things, put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. Looking forward to seeing you soon. Hope you'll be there. There's a sign up out here. I hope that you can make that. That will include a meal. We'll have more details about all of that next week. Here's a benediction. And we'll be dismissed to fellowship one another, with one another. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And God's people said, Amen. you are dismissed.